Thank you, Julie. I had a, was able to have a conversation this week with Harley and Isabel Kenningsburg, and Harley asked me if he could say a few words. And any time someone of that stature asks me if they can share a word, you bet. So Harley's back in the corner. He's going to stay back there. And uh, go ahead and share with us, Harley, words. Well, um, I grew up in the family with uh, seven brothers and two sisters. And uh, on, and my mother and dad on a 160-acre farm. And my oldest sister, she, she was the oldest. We we were in Sunday school and church every single Sunday morning, whether we wanted to or not. <laughs> and uh, every one of us, I'm happy to say, they all went into Christian work of, of some side, of some time. I was in the middle of the boys. And uh, uh, that isn't what I wanted to talk about today, but uh, um, uh, I accepted Jesus as my Savior uh, when I was 17 years old. Uh, I was too shy to to go forward up till then, but I told God, if you send one more person with me, I'll go, I'll go forward. So I and it did. That was 17, I was 17 years old, and and on uh, uh, June 11th, 11, uh, the second thing that I, I, very important in my life, uh, in 1950, on the 11th day of June, uh, I married Isabel, and uh, uh, she has been a wonderful wife and 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 mother. She's a very quiet little girl, like my mother was, and uh, she's a very kind person. She's a coupon clipper, and uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, we, we are very conservative because well, the first ten years that when we were married on the farm, uh, we had to be con conservative whether we wanted to or not, and uh, so it carried over, and. Uh, uh, God has blessed us, and uh, uh, we've had our ups and downs. And uh, I've had, I got, we moved to town, I think, 22 years ago. And the second year after we went, uh, I was diagnosed with, with cancer, and we've been battle mad ever since. But uh, everything has gone very well. God has kept me alive, and 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 she. She takes care of all the pills that they have to have, and uh, she is a very wonderful, kind, a little sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Harley. The if my math doesn't fail me and my hearing doesn't fail me, you guys have been married 64 years, is that correct? Congratulations. That's wonderful. If you would have your Bibles, we're not going to dismiss Children's Church today. And if you have your Bibles, if you would join me in Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books, Joshua, Judges. So, am I lit up right here? No. Judges chapter 6. Oh, I meant, uh, thanks, I, I went, I was, I was just wondering if something was like on me the whole time and I didn't know it, because there's a little projector there. Um, we're... We're running through Scripture and looking at Old Testament stories and um, trying to learn a lot. I was, uh, about two weeks ago, I, was, I had a, one of my favorite channels of late uh, that kind of drives Jolene crazy when I watch it, but it's, um, it's a sports 
mix channel or something. I don't know what it is, but there's eight different small screens on one channel. It's 205 Direct TV. Eight small screens, all sports. So anything going on sports, so I can watch a little bit of golf and tennis and basketball and hockey and every, all that at the same time. If I want to hear it, I just have to, I have to put it on one, one of those and then I can hear the one. Um, and that doesn't even matter, but I don't have time for that. But anyway, I was watching that the other day and on one of them there was a strongman competition. Have you seen any of these kind of things? And they were, they were flipping over these gigantic, these gigantic tractor tires or some kind of tires, flipping them over and over. And then there was these guys that had this giant cement ball and they lifted it up and they were putting it, I don't know why, but they were doing that. And then a little bit later, they were pulling a, this ginormous airplane and they strapped the airplane and they were like basically leaning way over and using their legs to pull this airplane. And it was like really, really impressive. Um, but I just want to say this to you, to you men on Father's Day. You don't have to be that strong or that great or that, right? You don't have to eat a, win a pie co- eating contest, although that was awesome for both of you. Um, what does make a great dad? I started thinking about that, and, and the reality of it is is that um, we're not going to be in the NBA. You know, we're not going to ever be an MMA champion or make the NFL or something. I'd say something about baseball, but that's not really even a sport. So anyway, all right, but, you know, we'll never... Okay, I'm, I've just made a lot of enemies right there. All right, we'll never... We'll probably never be one of those elite people, but we don't have to be. We'll... You don't have to leave. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, here's the good news. We don't have to be the best or the richest or the smartest or the best looking or the wisest or anything like that. God doesn't demand that of us. And as a matter of fact, the story today that we look at with Gideon, it, the Bible actually says that he was the least. And yet God used him for a mighty victory. So that's what we're going to look at today. That's the good news for us. Today, Let's just pray real quick. Father, I just pray that you would, in the next just few minutes, uh, multiply our hearing and multiply the words that are spoken from my mouth. May you, Holy Spirit, um, increase the importance of each word right to our very hearts that we might learn something and it can change us and draw us closer to you, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So we've been talking about how the Bible, this is actually number eight. You haven't been keeping track, it doesn't even matter. But epic stories of the Bible, number eight. And we've been talking about how there's only one story in the Bible. And it's based on one person that's of really importance, and that is? Very good. That's what we told the kids this week. Pastor Dusty would always say, "Just if you don't know what to say, just say Jesus. It'll be right somehow. But anyway, that is the correct answer. The Bible is about salvation that's accomplished in Jesus and through Jesus. The Old Testament and New Testament are not two books. They're one book, and it's all about one person, one Redeemer, one Savior, Jesus Christ. We have, week after week, looked at heroes of the Bible, quote-unquote heroes that we've looked at, and realized that sometimes they're not all that heroic. As a matter of fact, sometimes they make big mistakes. But they are not the point. They are not the key, and as as a matter of fact, in most cases, we shouldn't even emulate them, but the point is Jesus, and so that's what we've been looking at. I was looking up, um, some trying to help myself with some ideas about Gideon, and here's what I found out. If you look at children's literature about Gideon, almost every single one that I saw is this. The, The final point was this. You need to try and convey to your children that they need to be like Gideon. I think I'm going to show you over the next few minutes that I don't think we want to be like Gideon. But God used the least to do great things. Um, But we're going to see a a guy that messed up a lot. Now the kids are in here, and uh, I'm not used to the the teaching with the kids in here, and so I'm going to try and bring it down usually to a level that I can understand, which they'll be good there, so... But I'm not going to do as good Mary. I'm just going to tell you, Mary Malmbeck taught the kids this last week. It's amazing. Amazing job she did with the kids. 
I don't go down to that level where she dressed up, she did all this kind of cool stuff. Um, but I, I do think this is a good story, and I think we can all learn from it. And so, so here's what here's what children's material says: Teach your child to be more like Gideon. I mean, hey, after all, he took thirty-two thousand men and shrunk them down to three hundred and defeated the mighty Midianite army with a few trumpets and clay pots and torches. But see, that's that's not what I would want you to learn from today. As a matter of fact, I want you to learn almost almost the exact opposite. So I'll just tell you where we're going. Now see, that would be shining on me. Okay, so here's where we're going. I don't want you to be like Gideon and rely on anything. Well, he did at the end. Rely on God. That's where we're going. Rely on God and God alone. Um, Alright, Judges chapter 6 is where the story starts off. So here's where, we're, here's where we are in history. Judges chapter 6. I don't even know. Like, what's going on around in the world? Here's where we're at. 250 years earlier, God called Moses to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. So then they wandered for 40 years. So about two, we're about, we're, the children of Israel are in the promised land for about 200 years now. Almost 100 years from now, Saul is going to be elected as the first king of Israel. So right now, God is, the, is over Israel. He's reigning and ruling and He's using judges, which means kind of like prophets. He's sending men and women every once in a while to say, hey, um, you're messing up. Here's what God wants you to do. And Gideon ends up being one of, those, one of those guys. That's where we're at, though. 250 years from Egypt, 100 years from Saul, roughly. And so we're in that time where they're in the promised land, and so that's why it's so unusual that the Bible starts off in Judges chapter 6 with them being defeated because of their sin. Here's why I tell you this. Here's the first, the first verse of chapter 6. The Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now see, if I stop there, you're like, I have no idea where we are in history. They did that about 8,000 times in the Bible. Right? So that's why I told you. So they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord let the Midianites come in and take them over. And... The Midianites were, were taking all of their wheat, all of their food, taking all of their donkeys, all of their camels. They, was, they were taking everything. They had nothing. The Midianites came in, overpowered them, took everything from them. So then we're introduced to our main hero of the day. Um, let me find it. In chapter 6, down in verse... Let's start with 7. When the Israelites cried out to him because of Midian... The Lord sent a prophet to them. He said to them, This is what the Lord God of Israel says, I brought you out of Egypt and out of the place of slavery. I delivered you from the power of Egypt and from the power of all who oppressed you. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the God of the Amorites whose land you live in. But you did not obey me. Music changes. Here comes the hero. Ready? Ready? The angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak that was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, that's Gideon's father, the Abizite. His son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine vat in order to hide from the Midianites. Da, 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 boom, main character. Here comes Gideon. Where is he at? Hiding. Kind of like a cistern or a wine vat. He's hiding down there, threshing wheat so that nobody sees him. The Midianites don't see him, so they take his wheat. So here's our hero. And the angel of the Lord comes to him and appeared to him and says this. Look at verse 12. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. What? I'm confused. I just thought you've been bashing Gideon the whole time. Don't forget the order of what he just said. He's trying to convince Gideon more than he's trying to convince anybody else. He's saying this. Think of the order. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. See the difference? He did not come to Gideon and say, Hey, mighty warrior, the Lord is with you. I don't have time to develop it. Does, does that make sense? Hey, the Lord is with you, so therefore, here's what's coming. The Lord's with you, Gideon. You, you're going to be a mighty warrior because of the Lord. Not, I'm not coming to you because you're great and mighty. We'll find out more about that in a minute. 
Okay. So Gideon, verse 13, said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, those are my words, what's going on? The Midianites are taking all of our food. They're taking all of our possessions. They're killing our people. Why has all this happened? And where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about? I mean, all I've heard all growing up is that the Lord did this, and the Lord did this, and now here we are, and things don't look very good. And he's, so if you really are of the Lord, what's going on? We're still in verse uh, 13. They said, Hasn't the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in strength you, uh, the, the strength you have, and deliver Israel from the power of Midian. Am I not sending you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I deliver Israel? Look, my family is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the youngest of my father's house. So here we see Gideon. He's hiding out from the enemy. The Lord comes to him, and, and he's like, wait a minute, I'm not sure you're really the Lord, or this isn't the angel of the Lord. And by, by the way, um, I'm, the, I'm kind of a, the weakest family, or the weakest tribe, and I'm the weakest, the, the youngest in my house, and this doesn't make sense. And here's, here's where this relates to you and I. It makes perfect sense that Gideon would think this way because that's how we think too. God comes to you and God comes to me and He says, hey, I want to use you. I want you to do something for me. I want to use you in a special way. And the first thought in your mind is, why me? I'm not educated enough. I'm not smart enough. I don't have the resources. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I am the least. Why wouldn't you go ask somebody else? So we do, don't we? And so we're just like Gideon in this. And so it's, it's, you know, it's understandable that he would say, I'm the least. But let's keep going. Verse 15, um, how can this be? I'm the least. Verse 16, let me see where I'm at. But I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Midian down as if it were one man. So don't be surprised when God comes to you and says, hey, I want to use you. I want you to step up. I want you to get involved. I want you to be this person. I want you to talk to this person or call this person or I think you should be doing this. And you're like, well, wait, wait a minute. i got a whole bunch of excuses, God. Let me start writing them down. And God's saying, no, no, no. See, here's the thing. God uses the least. The Bible continues on. There's way too much for us to cover all of this. But then Gideon said to the angel of the Lord, If I have found favor in your sight, I, I want you to stay here. I'm going to go get an offering. And you just, you just hang out here. I want to make sure you're really from the Lord. So listen to this. He says, okay, I'll stay here. So you stay, stay right here. And he goes back and takes a goat and kills a goat and skins it and everything, gets it ready to, for sacrifice. He makes some unleavened bread and he gets some oil and then he carries it all the way back. He carries it back and sets it down on a rock by the angel of the Lord. And he's like, okay, I want to see if you really are the angel of the Lord. And so the angel of the Lord takes the this, this staff and, and touches the rock. It consumes, boom, in fire. So you'd think that Gideon would be, have it now, right? Okay, I've got this all figured out. Look at verse uh, 22. When Gideon realized that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Oh, no! That's what my Bible says. Oh, no! Now I've seen the Lord, I'm going to die! Oh. Isn't this all part of God's plan? Like God is... If, listen, if God comes to you, and this would be like, Oh, in basic training. My son's in basic training right now. Oh, it's great. I got a phone call from John today. My son is in basic training. Pick up the, I see the phone ringing. I was thinking, oh no, now what's Pastor Dusty? Oh, did I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't. No, I, I see this from John. Did I say that out loud? Because I'm really kind of Okay, so I, I see it's John. I run up to show Jolene and we talk to him. That was kind of cool. But anyway, in basic training, toward the end of basic training, our drill instructors said this, Today, if you look at me, you're going to do push-ups. 
And so then they'd walk around. All, now this is at the end when we could just crank out 20 push-ups like nothing, right? So they'd come by and, I, and we'd be sitting there working on my clothes or folding my socks or something. And they'd knock on the window and he'd be like, because he'd be like, mm, yep, down. And so you'd put, right? It's not, it's not like God is going to show up and say, hey, Gideon, look. And he's like, what? You looked at me. And he's going to kill him, right? That doesn't even make sense. So Gideon's like, oh. It really is God. I'm going to die now. Doesn't even make sense. But anyway, I don't have time. Let's move on. So he says, I've seen the Lord face to face. God's like, I'm not going to kill you. Don't worry. So then God says, okay, I think you've got it now. I picked you out. You were hiding from the enemy. I proved to you that I'm going to deliver your people from out of Midianite's hand. And I sent my angel. He did the whole rock thing and boom, burnt offering. You got it, Gideon? I think you've got it figured out, right? So he's, he goes this, all right, Gideon, here's what I want you to do. Your father, your father has a temple, I mean, a, an, an altar to Baal. And he has an Asherah pole. Now these are both where they would worship other gods. So he would sacrifice to Baal and he would, you know, bow down to this Asherah pole. And he says, Gideon, I want you to go, I want you to tear down the, the altar to Baal, build up another one to me. Use the wood from the Asherah pole to make a real nice altar to me and then worship me on that. And Gideon's like, oh, okay. So Gideon, our brave warrior hero, just goes out and does that, right? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, he does, but at night so that nobody would see him. See, your kids should be just like Gideon. Isn't that what we're striving for? To be just like Gideon. So he does it, but he does it at night. And then Joash, his father, says, oh, so they wanted to kill Gideon. Long story. They wanted to kill Gideon. And, and um, Gideon's father says, hey, if Baal's really that torqued off that you tore down, you know, maybe he'll kill the person that did it. Huh. So anyway, nothing happens because there is no God, Baal. So nothing happens, so Gideon moves on. So he calls all of the people together. So now he's emboldened a little bit more. And he calls a bunch of people together. And he gets an army of 32,000 men from Israel all around him. And they are going to take on the, the Midianites. Now that is what, now from here on is what you usually hear. Did you know all that other stuff about Gideon? The guy's got some issues already, doesn't he? Hmm, it's not over yet. Because then he's like, okay, God, like if this is really your will, have you ever heard of the fleece thing? Yeah, see, he's still not done doubting. So he takes the fleece and says, God, okay, God, if you're really going to deliver the Midianites into, into my hands, and the, if you've really gone ahead of us, I'm going to put down this fleece, and in the morning I want the fleece to be wet and the, dry to be, the ground to be completely dry. And so God, being the patient God that he is, says, okay. So Gideon gets up in the next morning, picks up the fleece, wrings it out, fills a bowl full of water, and the ground is all dry. And then Gideon says, um, <clears throat> um, Don't be mad, God, but um, can we do that again? I'm still not quite sure. Can we do it again? Only let's reverse it this time, because I kind of fell asleep in science class, and I'm not really sure whether maybe that happens every night. So here's the fleece. Keep the fleece dry and the ground wet, and God does it. Now, people have built a theology around that, thinking that you should test God like that. The reality of it is, is that the only reason Gideon did that is because he lacked faith. He lacked faith. It's not that the Bible's telling you, oh, you should do this. He didn't have faith. Here's the good news, men and women. Boys and girls, here's the good news. Bless you. Here's the good news. It doesn't matter how much faith you have. It's, it's your, what you do is not based on the bigness of your faith. It's based on the bigness of your God. Amen? See, Jesus says, even if you have the faith as small as a mustard seed, you can do great things because it's not about you. It's about everybody it's not about you, it's about Him. It's about God. So your small little faith doesn't matter. The, the bigness of your faith or the smallness of your faith doesn't matter. It's about the bigness of your God. 
And so here's what God says. It says, Gideon, I have delivered the Midianites into your hand. I think it's chapter 7, verse 6. Let's go see. Chapter 7, verse 9. How about that? That night the Lord said to him, Oh, wait a minute. We're not, see, we're not done. Oh, we're not done with Gideon yet. So he does the whole fleece thing, so now you'd think he's good to go, right? So he gets his 32,000 people, army, and they got swords and they got shields, and he's like, I'm ready. And God says, um, no, no, you're not quite, because you have way too many men. And um, so, long story short, here's what happens. He says, hey guys, anybody, anybody scared? You can leave. 32,000 men. You scared? You can leave. 22,000 of them leave. Right? They had commitments, said whatever. I got kids, I don't want to die. Okay, whatever. So, 22,000 left. 10,000 soldiers left. God says, no, no, no. There's still too many. Um, you guys are going to think that you did this on your own. And I want you to know that I'm going to give you the victory. So there's still too many of you. So here's what you're going to do. You're going to go down to the creek and you're going to have them all take a drink and I'm going to have you separate them. And so all the guys that just dive down in there and just start drinking with their face in the water, he put on one side. The guys that came over and went like this and lapped like a dog, he separated those. There was 300 of those. Now I've heard stories. I've heard people teach on this. I might have done it myself. But he was trying to separate out the 300 that would sit there and be on watch and lap. That's not even the point. He, it wasn't to find the 300 strongest men or the wisest soldiers. They, they weren't even going to have swords or shields. So I've heard a lot of teaching about this. So here's what I'm, here's what I'm going to tell you. Here's what I think the moral of the story is. He was getting it down so small. See, he could have kept the 9,700. No, he wanted 300 to make sure that they knew it was not them that was going to get the victory, that it was God that was going to get the victory. Amen? So here's 300 men. And so Gideon's like, okay. Man, I've seen some really cool stuff already, but uh, I'm still not sure, God. So God says, this is... Uh, Chapter 7, verse 9, God says, okay, here's, here's the deal. I'm going to give you the victory, but if you're still not sure, if you take your servant, and his name is uh, Pura, if you take Pura and go down to the camp, um, and you, you'll get some encouraging news. And Gideon's like, okay. Gideon's not like, no, 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 God, I, <laughs> you got this. I, I, look, I've seen all kinds of... You got this. I'm, I'm good. Hmm. Your kid should be just like Gideon. So he goes, okay. So he takes Pura down. And it just happens, circumstances, they get up to this particular tent where these particular guys are talking. And they're like, yeah, I had a dream last night that this loaf of bread rolled down the hill. It's like, really? That's kind of cool. What, what do you think that meant? And the other guy says, oh, I know what it meant. It means that God has delivered... That us into the hand of Gideon. That's how I'd interpret that dream. Okay. Anyway, so Gideon, now here's one good thing he did. So let's look at 7.15. Because I do want to give him props when he does something right. When Gideon heard the account of the dream and its interpretation, he bowed in worship. He returned to Israel's camp and said, Get up. For the Lord has handed the Midian camp over to you. And he says, now do this. We're going to separate. hundred of us here, hundred of us there, hundred of us there. We're going to take, we're going to take, in our left hand we've got a pot with a torch in it. In our right hand we've got our trumpet. And what we're going to do is we're going to blow the trumpet, smash the pot, hold the torch up with our left hand, hold the trumpet up with our right hand, and... I don't know how, but God's going to give us the victory. So when you see us hundred do that, you guys do it, and you guys do it, and that's what they did. So 300 men surrounding the Midianites did that. They all woke up. It was about midnight. The, the shift, guard shift just changed, and they, I don't know what that matters, but it matters because the Bible says it, and so they shifted guards, and then they did that at, at midnight, and so boom, the trumpets go, clay pot smashed, torches are there, 
the Midianites come out of their tents and start killing each other. And God gave them great victory. And then Gideon goes and gets those all those thirty, those twenty nine hundred guys that weren't involved, and they chase them down, and and the victory is pretty complete. So what does that mean for us? See, because Gideon, Gideon did not defeat the Midianites. God defeated the Midianites. Here's how I know. They had a, a torch and a trumpet. <clears throat> a paradigm is something that you... It's something you believe that you just like it's in you, it's it's in it's in you down deep, right? And here's what God was trying to show them, and what I think He's trying to show us today. That you and I and them have a self sufficiency that needs to be crushed. Assembly, let me turn it around. God was trying to crush the self sufficiency that they had. They were relying on themselves. That's what that means. They were sufficient on themselves. And so he says, I'm going to give you a great victory and you are going to basically do nothing but obey me. You and I have that problem as well. Our default is, oh, I need to do something. Um... A couple years ago, let me see if I can find it. If I can't find it in my Bible, then the Lord might have blessed you. I don't know. Oh, there it is. A couple years ago, I kind of purged the church rolls a little bit by bashing a famed and beloved poem. And I'm going to do that again today. Not because I'm trying to get rid of you, I remember David used to wear this, this bracelet. It said F-R-O-G. Anybody know what that stands for besides frog? <laughs> That's awesome. What, is that, what does that stand for? Jesus. Oh, yeah. Now, here's what I like about that. He, he's listening. Okay, this particular bracelet, F-R-O-G, fully rely on God. Anybody agree with that? That we should fully rely on God. That'd be a, a good thing. Our default, though, this paradigm shift that God's trying to take care of in us is to get rid of self-sufficiency and to fully rely on Him. So it sneaks, in, it sneaks into our culture. God doesn't bless us because of the size of the faith that we have, but because of the size of our God. Amen? That's the Gospel. We trust in Him and have faith in Him and not in us. That's the Gospel. God meets us in our lack of faith and saves us and delivers us despite our weaknesses. That's the Gospel. It means good news. That's the good news for us. That we don't have to be the strongest and the best and the brightest and the fastest and the wealthiest and all those kind of things. The Gospel is that we are weak. He is strong. So then we get to the point where we begin to live it out and we realize that we don't always do that. And it shows up in places that, that I wish it didn't, but... So here's the paradigm ship, uh, shift. Um, this is, a, it's, this is a, a poem or a prayer or a, I don't know what it is. It's, it's a footprints in the sand. So let me just say this before you get mad and leave. Let me say this. I know a lot of you probably have it hanging up at home. And your grandmother, you know, probably got saved with it and made you memorize it and all this kind of... I'm, seriously, I, it was done with w really good intentions, I'm sure. Here's the problem. It is horrible theology. Yeah, horrible. Horrible theology. And I, I want to kind of show you why. And just, not, see, I, I know, like, you want to throw something at me right now. I understand. Okay, but let me just hang with me for a minute, and I'm going to try and help us through. Because 
God needs to change the paradigms in our head. So I'm going to read this, and, and you try and tell me what's wrong with it. And you might be so in love with it that you don't even see it, but I'll help you out. One night I had a dream. I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord, and across the sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand. One belonged to me, and the other to the Lord. When the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that many times along the path of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I noticed that it happened at the very lowest and saddest times of my life. This really bothered me. And I questioned the Lord about it. Lord, you said that once I decided to follow you, I, I got a problem with that one, but anyway, let's move on. You would walk with me all the way. But I have noticed that during the most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why in times when I needed you the most, you should leave me. Here it comes. I'm sorry. I'm, that's what I'm reading. The Lord replied, My precious, precious child, I love you. And I would never, never leave you during your times of trial and suffering. When you saw only one set of put, footprints, it was then that I carried you. <sighs> Did you see it? Did you see the self-sufficiency that we live in? See, I, I want to walk by myself. Here, let me turn this backwards. God, I got this. I'm going to walk by myself. Now, when things get tough, I'm going to jump in your lap. But otherwise, I got this. Folks, that is horrible, horrible theology. And it is a horrible way to live. And yet, so many of us do that. The only time we cry out to God is when we need something. Here's what I say. God, I want you to carry me the whole time. The whole time, because nothing that I do is of any value. Nothing that, that I do will matter one bit. So God, I'm jumping in. See, Jesus, when He went to the cross, was being carried by the Father. He was perfectly in God's will. I'm not saying that you don't do anything. I'm saying that you do more, only you're in God's, you know, He's carrying you. Are you tracking me? I know that's a horrible image, isn't it? <clears throat> okay. Let me say it this way. Gideon, let me wrap this up real quick. Gideon, Gideon needed to understand that God had said, listen, Gideon, I am going to give you victory. Trust me. Oh God, I can't trust you. Can you show me a sign? Can you show me a sign? Can you show me another sign? Can I, right? God's, God says, Gideon, I'm, I'm going to give you a victory. Just trust me. But God, I had it. I, I had it figured out. I had 32,000 soldiers with spears and shields. I had it figured out. And you told me to get rid of them. I know. It's because I'm doing the work. Not you. So then Jesus comes along. And in Genesis, you want to talk about salvation? Genesis 3.15 God declared that He's going to crush Satan and Jesus is going to win. Genesis 3. The, the whole Bible is about Jesus wins. And here's what He says. Quit trying to do it yourself. Oh, let me quote a verse. The, the anti-footprints in the sand verse. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. See, you don't have to believe me about that poem. Believe this. For by... Grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, so that no one would boast. God says, Gideon, I'm going to give you the victory so that you can't boast. And God does the same thing for us. He says, Jesus already won. I'm going to give you the victory and it's not about you. Isn't that great? It's not about you. It's about Him. It's about who, Taylor? 
Jesus. It's about what He did. So He wants to take our self-sufficiency and destroy it. Luke chapter 9, and then I'll have Pastor Dusty come up. Luke chapter 9 says this, the disciples got into an argument about who would be the greatest. Isn't that just like us? Then an argument started among them about who would be the greatest among them. But Jesus, knowing the thoughts of their hearts, took a little child and had him come over and stand by Jesus. And he says, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes him who sent me. For, listen to this. Listen to this. And these are the last words I say. For whoever is least among you, this one is great. God's words.